David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel were awarded a Nobel Prize in 1981 for their discovery of hierarchical organization in the visual systems of cats and primates, and for their work on many other aspects of visual processing in the brain. Remember the early stages in the processing of visual information. The light hits the retina, and the retina sends its outputs to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, which is a sort of relay station between the eye and the primary cortex. The visual system, starting with the retina, parcels out the visual field into small sections, and it's not until you get into higher visual areas that these bits of information get integrated into larger holes. For instance, a given cell can only respond to a small area of the whole visual field, which in this picture would be represented as one of the squares to the left. This is what is called the light-sensitive area or receptive field of a given cell. In this case, the yellow bar in the left would be within the receptive field of a cell. Earlier on, Stephen and Kuffler had discovered that within their receptive field, some ganglion cells in the retina respond well to small spots of light, but not to big spots. The reason is that these cells have what is called a sensitive center and an antagonistic surround. These cells are thus called center surround cells. If light hits the center, they become activated, but if it falls in its immediate surroundings, it becomes inhibited. So if you present light in the form of a big spot, you're both stimulating it and inhibiting it. So the stimulus is not as effective as a smaller spot which just stimulates the center. Likewise, there are cells in the lateral geniculate nucleus that have the same properties. Detecting small circular points is all very well, but unless you live in a universe composed entirely of polka dots, your brain still has a long way to go to process the visual complexity of the world. Hubel and Wiesel were interested, then, in the cells of the primary visual cortex. They wanted to know how they worked and uh, what they were sensitive to. They wanted to know at which point in the brain the complexity of our visual perception starts to emerge and take shape. Hubel and Wiesel did their research by showing images to anesthetized cats, while simultaneously recording the activity of individual neurons in their primary visual cortex. They put an electrode next to a cell to record the signal associated with the cell's action potential. The microelectrode was connected to an amplifier, which then sent the amplified signal to an oscilloscope. So they could both observe and hear evidence of a cell being activated. A vertical deflection in the oscilloscope means a voltage difference, which indicates that the cell is active. You can also hear a sort of click sound when the cell sends a signal. They started by probing the simplest hypothesis, namely that cortical cells respond to dots, just like ganglion cells do. At the beginning, the results were disappointing. No matter how many stimuli they presented to the cat, the cells did not condescend to respond. They jumped up and down, played their arms at the cat, and nothing. They were at their wit's end. How is it possible that cells in the visual cortex won't respond to visual stimuli? Until they had their eureka moment. In their own words, rather by accident, one day we were shining small spots, either white spots or black spots, onto the screen, and we found that the black dot seemed to be working in a way that at first we couldn't understand until we found that it was the process of slipping the piece of glass into the projector, which swept a line, a very faint, precise narrow line across the retina, and every time we did that, we'd get a response. So, as they removed their slides from the projector, the border of a given slide presented a straight edge, and they started to hear a crackling noise. This was their recording equipment indicating that a neuron was firing. After running excitedly through the corridors of their lab building, they continued systematically exploring the responses of certain neurons. They found that, in the primary visual cortex, cells don't respond to small spots. Instead, the earliest neurons respond to straight edges of a certain orientation. You can see here the response of a cell to bars of different orientations. So you can appreciate that this cell is at its most active in the presence of a vertical line. And you start to guess less and less active as you approach the horizontal. So within its receptive field, a cell prefers a certain orientation. It is very specific. So within the same square or receptive field, some neighboring cells prefer other orientations. The one in the picture is horizontal, but some are vertical, some are oblique. So 
These cells that respond to certain orientations in contours are the building blocks out of which more complex representations of objects are constructed. Hubel and Wiesel call them simple cells. These simple cells are arranged in columns so that all cells within a single column respond to the same orientation and those in neighboring columns respond to similar orientations. And as the distance between columns increases, the distance in the preferred angle also increases. Moreover, they propose a model of how the presence of edges in simple cells is computed from the input received from centers around cells. The basic idea is that a bar is constructed out of dots, so that if a simple cell gets positive input from a group of thalamic centers around cells, which are arranged in a straight line, then the simple cell will aggregate the inputs and represent an edge. So, if you show a straight line to a given part of the visual field, this will activate a group of centers around cells first in the retina, then in the thalamus, which are in the appropriate angles to each other, and their collective activation will in its turn activate the simple cell of the relevant orientation. Notice that a larger shape, such as a rectangle, won't do much for the simple cell. This is because centers around cells are inhibited by light outside their center area, so anything wider than a thin line would trigger too much inhibition. Simple cells then pass their activation to another kind of cell discovered by Hubel and Wiesel, which they called complex cells. These cells sum and integrate the input from simple cells and are sensitive to orientation and motion. These, in their turn, pass their activations to hypercomplex cells, which process more complex features. Area V1 projects to area V2, the secondary visual cortex, where neurons are tuned to the same features as neurons in V1, as well as to more complex features, such as shape and depth. Through the ventral pathway, neurons go from V2 to V4 and construct further representations that incorporate more information about figure ground segmentation as well as about colors. The signal then goes to the inferior temporal cortex, IT. The fusiform face area, FFA, is specialized for face recognition. The fusiform body area is specialized for identifying the human body and body parts. In some, simple cells detect lines of certain orientation, then further layers assimilate and recombine the information, and this allows them to represent more complex stimuli, like curves or straight angles, which are in their turn composed into more complex figures, like the curvature of a head, for example. So, as information is passed through more and more layers of processing, the representations become more complex and elaborate. You can see, then, the outline of a hierarchical system for processing visual stimuli in which earlier components detect simpler features and then feed these features into subsequent parts that construct more complex representations out of those inputs. This extremely simplified diagram represents the fit-forward, or bottom-up, flow of information, though I have to say that there are lots of feedback loops in the cortex which allow for top-down processing. Okay, what does this have to do with neural networks? If you remember, by the start of the 70s, research in neural networks had almost come to a halt in the United States, in the wake of Minsky and Papert's work on the limitations of perceptrons, and also because perceptron technology had failed to deliver on many of its promises. However, researchers in Japan kept the flame of neural networks alive. They weren't too concerned with Minsky and Papert. They thought that Minsky and Papert was a cop show. So, inspired by Hubel and Wiesel's discoveries in the hierarchical nature of visual processing, Japanese engineer Kunehiko Fukushima proposed in the 1970s a series of neural network architectures for machine vision, which came to a peak in a device that he called the Neocognitron. The layers of the Neocognitron were arranged hierarchically so that those units closer to the input represent line orientations while successive layers combine the material from previous layers into more complex representations. Fukushima even borrowed Hubel and Wiesel's terminology of simple and complex cells to describe the units in the first and second layers, respectively, of the neocognitron. The neocognitron was successful at recognizing handwritten digits and was able to recognize figures even when they had shifted position and had been deformed. Sadly, though, it did not perform so well when it was applied to more complex tasks. A parenthesis. One thing that has been common to the models we've covered so far is the use of all-time sci-fi sounding names, like the perceptron, the cognitron, and the neocognitron, 
you can almost imagine the poster of a movie. The Amazing Neocognitron vs. Godzilla. Or The Invasion of Perceptrons. These days, this practice has been lost, and neural networks are given boring, stem-sounding names that do not lend themselves to juvenile jokes. So, if you ever become a famous neural network researcher, please remember to give your network a fun name. End of digression. Later on, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, researchers Jean Lecon and Joshua Benjo were in their turn inspired by Fukushima's work. They came up with a model called Lunet 5. What did I tell you? Boring name. This was one of the earliest convolutional networks. Lunet 5, shown here in a simplified diagram, combined brain-inspired hierarchical composition of features, which was already present in the neocognitron, with the backpropagation learning algorithm. In addition, their system had superior training data and faster processing power. Lynette was even commercially successful. It was reliable enough to be used by the USPS to automate the reading of zip codes written on mail envelopes. So we have mentioned convolutional networks, but what are those? In the next video, we'll give an introduction to them. Mm -hmm.